Nobody, so far as I know, finds out that a newborn child has Down syndrome, shrugs, and returns to decorating the nursery. We were undone by the news for a long time. If Down syndrome were ordinary in the world, if a common sense view of dignity and personhood and capability prevailed, then perhaps our early days would have been easier. But Down syndrome is not ordinary in the world. I kept looking things up against whispers in my own brain, against shocked silence, against the raw unfamiliarity of our newest family member. I turned to fact. I felt not just ignorant, but culpably ignorant. And yet in my reading, I only found my own confusion writ large. I felt that Laura's life was valuable, that she was a child, a sister and daughter and granddaughter above all, that she might learn and thrive. I also felt that our lives were over, that her birth was a tragedy, and that we were condemned to a half-life of hospitals, acronyms, therapists, and forms. In my unhinged research, I discovered that everything was true. She was a child first, but of course she could have this problem, this one, this one, and this one. Or the big list came first, typically framed as they. They have heart defects, intestinal atresias, low IQs, joint problems, and on and on, but they're happy little tykes. None of it made sense. I did not see how a child could be happy if she had so many problems. I did not see how, with so many problems, she could be a child first. I'd sought refuge in fact, like someone who ducks into a cathedral for quiet and instead finds an echo chamber for every footfall. Or I was the echo chamber, thronged with a dense collision of numbers and hope and resignation. There were, it seemed, two kinds of stories told about my daughter. In one, she seemed to be a developing child. In the other, she seemed not even human. She was a defect, a tragedy, an abnormality. I did not see how she could be both. It was as if Teresa had given birth to a blur. How to tell Laura's story. How to explain the way my vision had changed. Laura had long been one of us, a fully vested member of our family, and the happiness she brought us was real, without dilution or asterisk. She was a part of our story. Her trisomy had complicated that story from heart surgery to speech therapy but her genetic beginnings, on paper, far less promising than Ellie's, had resulted in no less happiness. The genome is the beginning of the story, not the end. In time, I came to see our situation this way. Laura has a double inheritance. Like Ellie, Laura inherits the extraordinary luck of an American middle-class life. She's loved, insured, and free. But unlike Ellie, she was born with a recognizable genetic disorder. As a result, she also inherits a history of misunderstanding and our anxieties about what our chromosomes have to do with who we are. Teresa said once that Laura has Laura syndrome, that I have George syndrome, and that Ellie has Ellie syndrome. We all have our risk factors. The difference with Laura is that her risk factors are known. Because chromosomes are easy to see under the microscope, because people with Down syndrome have a distinctive appearance and because Down syndrome has been extensively studied, we could have that knowledge for one child and not for another. But for parents in the near future and perhaps for all of us, that distinction may be coming to an end. There may never be a human clone or a child engineered for musical ability, but the era of personal, personalized genomic medicine, long predicted, is all but here. In the wake of the Human Genome Project, it is now possible to sequence, letter by letter, a full set of human chromosomes. A few people have had, already had this done, and though having a full personal reading of the Book of Life is still too expensive for you and me, it will soon be commonplace. As the price of a finished sequence comes down, we will each come to possess the book we already own. We will carry it to the doctor's office, on a compact disc, on an iPod, and we will live our lives by the book, adjusting our medical choices to its predictions. We will have numbers for everything, for heart de disease, lung cancer, diabetes, depression, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, obesity. We may in some cases have better medical interventions to choose from, but even when we have no cure, we will still have the numbers. In other words, we will all know our syndromes. In this way, at least, Laura, born days after the publication in Nature and Science of the draft of who we are, is typical of us all. Her inheritance is ours. For the last three years, I have been interviewing women who had prenatal testing, learned that the fetus had Down syndrome, and continued the pregnancies. I was well into my research about 18 months in when I decided to start interviewing women who terminated their pregnancies because the fetus had Down syndrome. My research suggests that these are interviews 
that have very rarely been done if they have been done at all. I was surprised to learn that for the most part, this population of women who terminated <coughs> has not been interviewed and their decision-making process hasn't been examined from a feminist disability studies perspective. Because this population was a mystery to me, I had preconceived notions. I went into these interviews uh, expecting obvious decisions. Like, of course, when I found that the fetus was, de was defective, I terminated. What I learned through these interviews was that my expectations and assumptions were entirely wrong. I heard stories of pain and confusion. I heard stories of love. The same stories I heard from women who had continued their pregnancies. Going into the interviews, I wasn't thinking of these women who terminated as mothers at all. I was thinking of them as potential parents. I didn't see terminating as weaker parenting because I didn't see it as parenting, but instead as a decision not to become a parent. The experience of women who terminated was exactly the opposite of what I expected. They told me that it was because of their love for their child, their willingness to sacrifice their own happiness, their desire to be a good mother, that they'd had testing and that they terminated. As Raina Rapp explains in Testing Women, Testing the Fetus, ending a pregnancy to which one is already committed because of a particular diagnosed disability forces each woman to act as a moral philosopher of the limits, adjudicating the standards guarding entry into the human community for which she serves as the normalizing gatekeeper. She must make conscious the fears, fantasies, and phobias she holds about mothering a disabled child. And she frequently thinks in a vacuum lacking much social context for what a particular medi di medical diagnosis of a disability might really imply. Lacking a societal context means in part lacking a story, which is a large part of what my research is addressing. Both sets of women I spoke with were telling stories that are not heard. And our society doesn't provide space for these women, for a woman to hope, to discuss hoping for a miscarriage or for a woman to discuss holding her dead child with great love. In part, we're not comfortable hearing these stories because they're painful. In addition, the stories are somewhat threatening to mainstream discourse because they offer no clear answers. None of the women I interviewed described an easy clarity as she made her decision. This is ultimately what it means to be faced with this painful, complex choice which all these women faced. As mothers said in conversations with me, conversations that happened after the, after the decision had been made, and here's just a list of quotes, where's the out? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. As if it could get more complicated. I wanted something to determine it for me. There's always that lingering exploration. I didn't want to make that decision. And those are quotes from both sets of women. For the women I spoke with, their desire to be mothers was the same, and not just a desire, but a commitment to motherhood. Their priorities were the same. They loved their child and wanted to do what was best most compassionate, most loving for that child. And their interpretations of the world were often the same too. So Denise and Mariah both recognized the possibility of rape and abuse in a world that's hostile toward women and toward people with intellectual disabilities. They were faced with the same decision and they had the same tools to grapple with it. And what I am gonna conclude with is that these tools were and are inadequate.